Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 6, titled Junk Love. It originally premiered on November 8th, 1985. It was written by Julia Cameron, which I believe is the first time we've had a female written episode of Miami Vice. So I was actually quite excited for this week. Uh, the director is Michael O'Harely, who also directs the next, the very next episode in Tale of the Goat. He directed a ton of TV, um, no movies. I did note that he directed 32 episodes of Hawaii Five O. So <laughs> we got that going for us Welcome in this episode. Dano. <laughs> <laughs> so I think... I think we're on the fence with this so episode. So speaking, speaking of 80s cop shows, I watched a commercial earlier today. Um, they made a movie out of the old cop show Chips. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, how do you make a movie out of a, out of a TV show from the 80s that wasn't even that? Hey, I like Chips. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you try well, and ruin Eric Estrada's <laughs> Past. Well, yeah, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> his, that's such a strong legacy of his. <laughs> it's the only thing he did. He did besides sell land in the swampland or something. I think it was. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering. I'm just curious. And someone pointed this out on Twitter. How come every remake of these? 80s cop shows is a comedy chips wasn't necessarily a comedy and neither was 21 jump street yes i'm no. highly offended at the 21 jump street because it was not a comedy yeah there was some and, funny parts in there but it's not a comedy it's serious like it's serious business all right <laughs> and that was it, my it's question the same thing melissa is that um, this seems like that these studios are directly attacking you i know First, they're coming after the 21 me jump street movie then there was a Jim and a Holograms movie, and now there's going to be a Chips movie. Defend your childhood, Melissa. Um, please don't live, leave out the Miami Vice movie they made. That was terrible. <laughs> okay. Are you offended by Jamie Foxx or Colin Farrell? <laughs> Actually, I kind of like Colin Farrell. I can't help it, but Jamie Foxx did not belong there. <laughs> the whole movie hey. was stupid, so yeah. Hey. I'm offended by the whole thing, he, all right? He was up the tub's quality, apparently. <laughs> I don't know what's happening to our childhood, Melissa, and all these remakes from the 80s. John, you definitely, you're a little little bit younger, so it's like still part, although just wait till, till they start remaking the early 90s stuff, then all hell's going to break loose. Yeah, wait See, till they wanna want to make a remake of Sandlot How? or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep waiting for it to happen because I know it's coming soon, it, and it's l stuff like Red Dawn and stuff where it's like it's coming. They, they're gonna yeah. start remaking '90s stuff real quick. They, I, I believe that remake of Point Break got put out, so that's just blasphemy. Oh, we don't even need it to talk did. about that it movie. Was terrible, <laughs> and it deserved not, to not make money. <laughs> if there is no Patrick Swayze in it, it cannot be Point Break. So no, <laughs> just no. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, let's get over and go talk about this episode. It's a pretty serious episode, which is uh, much different than the recent ones. Although all of our episodes are serious, this one is a uh, this one's a little darker than what we've had in the last few weeks. All right, so we have a really strong opening. Not just as strong in the fact that we are in a brothel, but we also get a very, very big guests are right out of the gate so the episode opens up and we are clearly in it there's women walking around in lingerie all over so, the place so brothel brothel makes sense i had hooker convention written down <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is that mine says ow as soon as <laughs> <laughs> they could be pajama salesmen who automatically just think they're hookers they could just be women who are modeling pajamas. I, I just love how Tubbs at the counter and he's like picking out his girl. He's like, you know, can I get Janet's face with like Foxy's body? <laughs> out of like a catalog too, it's like a binder. He's like turning the pages. Nah, I don't like that one. No, not that yeah, one. Yeah, you know, it's like one of those binders. You remember when you used to go get a haircut? They yes. had the binder of all the different haircuts. <laughs> That's how Tubbs his hookers. <laughs> well, the whole vice team is working this case. The uh, Sunny's out driving around in the Ferrari. The ladies are sucking Guess up what on the Gina street. and Judy are doing. <laughs> yeah. It's a surprise Go that ahead. the ladies are, are pretending to be hookers out on the street. Again. <laughs> but, I wonder if they do hooker things in their off time. <laughs> Keep it up on their hooker skills, yes. <laughs> Inside, as you mentioned, Tubbs is looking through a book and he's talking to Ivory Jones, the proprietor of this brothel, and happens to be the one and only Miles Davis 
of all people behind the counter in this episode. Yeah, and it took me a, it took a minute for it to register with me that it was Miles Davis. My first note on him was like he looks like he would be like a famous jazz musician, you know, <laughs> nice. who would play with everyone famous. And I was like, wait a minute. He looks so really close. familiar. So yeah. close, John. Oh, You're that's right Miles there. Davis. He is a famous jazz musician. So if, if you don't know him, he is famous for albums like Birth of Cool, Ground About Midnight, and Kind of Blue. Ground About Midnight has a little Coltrane on there as well. Kind of Blue is my favorite, though. I, I can get down with Kind of Blue. I listen to that sometimes when I'm doing housework. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm imagining you getting down to it. <laughs> hey, believe it or not, it's it's stuff like Ground About Midnight that actually made me want the saxophone as a kid. You know, John, I will say I have to appreciate because of how many times jazz has come up in this episode that we have someone who's interested in jazz on the show. Because otherwise we would just blow right through that Miles Davis was on this show. (laughs) Can I say that I didn't know he was a jazz musician at all? I just knew he was Miles Davis. And I was like, so that's like some famous old guy. Like, cool. We literally, I didn't until John said he was a jazz. I was like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. That's why he always has a trumpet with him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tubbs, Tubbs, he makes uh, someone named Frenchie. It's called Frenchie. I don't know if it's called Ivory. Ivory all sound Frenchie. He was outside in the bug van listening in. So Tubbs is definitely wearing a wire. And when Tubbs goes up to the room with Frenchy, she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. And <laughs> she's being French. No. <laughs> yeah. and then you hear a crash from, from the room next door, and Tubbs comes running out, and the John from, from that room comes out too, says, she's being me. She, and Tubbs like, puts him up against the wall, and there's like a I, I don't whole know why he's of... so angry. <laughs> you have to pay more for that bite, you. <laughs> comes from experience, it sounds like. Just saying, biting is extra, all that kinky type of stuff. (laughs) The B team calls Crockett and says, hey, they need help. So he grabs Gina. They race over to go help Rico. Rico runs over to the room next door and sees that what happened was is that the the John was saying, she bit me. It got a little too rough. She bit me real hard. So he smashed her into a mirror that was inside of the room. So when Chubbs goes running in there, she's unconscious on the ground. Crockett and Gina come running in. Crockett just tells the guy to stay there. They go into the room and asks Tubbs, like, are you okay? Is she okay? And if you if Rico needs any help, and that's when Ivory just finally catches on. It's like, who the hell are you guys? This is Really strange how you two were talking to each other. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is kind of like the weirdest sting ever because we don't necessarily know what the the, the sting is. We assume it's a sting on the brothel. And, and then just everything kind of just falls to crap and let, it, they just kind of run in like, like screw it. <laughs> Time out. Someone got hurt. <laughs> um, and, and then Tubbs, Tubbs keeps asking her, her name and I, I just – She's just sitting there. She's not saying anything. And I kept hoping, like, like, come on, just say it. Say it. My name is Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for, like, Diamond or Nevaeh or Cinnamon, something like that. <laughs> After Ivory finally says, like, he finally puts together, like, who the hell are you guys? And Crockett says that they're Vice. We go over to, we start with the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the precinct. And so the girl, they have the girl in an, in an interrogation room and Castillo and Gina are watching her through the two, through the one way mirror. Her name is Rosella. We don't know that yet, but we find out later her name is Rosella and she's just in there crying and she's crying saying, don't let him find out. She's don't tell him just saying that over and over and over again. And then they have Ivory in the, in a different room and that's where the, duo are interrogating him in a separate room. Switek comes in and tells Castillo and Gina, like, hey, I got bad news. The wire that Tubbs was wearing, they weren't able to get any of the recording from either when his conversations with Ivory or his conversations with the John where he said that he smashed her into the window or into the mirror. So they're not able to use that. So they technically got nothing other than they picked these two up. Castillo has a lot of information though on Ivory Jones. Says he's a retired smuggler. He used to work for Juan Carlos Silva. I bet you he met him in Thailand. (laughs) Everything's got to go back to Thailand. Yes, it does. (laughs) Yeah, so I mean... 
Uh, let's start the episode off with uh, Vice Squad being incompetent and in that the <laughs> whole setup for this sting, a whole reason they were there was to get this wire and get everything on tape, and that's ruined. And they just yep. luck out and stumble on to Ivory Jones, who happens to be a world-famous smuggler. I yeah. guess. <laughs> World famous, world famous might be <laughs> overstating it. I mean, like you walk down I don't the street, know. Castillo like, seems hey. pretty proud of him. Well, I mean, but Castillo worked for the CIA, so <laughs> he has he has knowledge that other people don't, right? Like he doesn't have like just everyday knowledge. Yeah, and Castillo comes into the room where interrogating Ivory Jones, and he has his file, and he gives us the background on Ivory. He says he used to arrange passports for Vietnamese women, so that's got to be where he, why he knows why he so knows much them. about yep. Ivory, right? He would arrange, he would tell mm-hmm. Vietnamese women that he would get them a passport to, to the U.S., and when they get there, they were going to marry a soldier. And then they would pay him $5,000 to be able to go do that. But then when they got to the U.S., he would just drop them into the brothels and then make them work there. But Ivory... He, he tries to defend himself by only saying that he's pure now. That's I like that. <laughs> but he's, he's working at a brothel. So how is he pure? I mean, he had a binder full of hookers. Like, that does not make you pure. <laughs> if you have a binder full of hookers, you are not pure. I'm sorry. <laughs> I seem to think Ivory Jones is a pretty good setup, man. Because, I mean, he must. how long has he been doing this? Yeah, exactly. Like, he must be. And he hasn't gotten caught yet. In between that other, like, why didn't they catch him for the other stuff? I never, they never said, right? Or no, they didn't say, are they prosecuting him or anything? No. The only other background information that they give is that Ivory used to work for Juan Carlos Silva and in their file that the commonality between them, between Ivory Jones and Silva now is that they both happen to know Rosella. So now we have a nice tight knit story. Where the woman they picked up, Ivory Jones, and the drug runner that they're going to go after all happen to have a tie together. By chance. Coincidence, all right. (laughs) (laughs) Later at the hospital, the vice team, the duo, goes over to go see Rosella. So the the duo goes with Castillo. They go to ask her about Silva. She says that she knows him, but he's dead to her. That She also says that she grew up in that house, which ding, 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 ding. Spoiler. number one. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that she grew up in his house and that she hates him. That she ran away from Selva. And, a, and she says he's a monster. Like, he's a he's a monster. He's a terrible person. And that she's been... get another hit of uh, heroin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She says that yeah, she's been with... The whole with... time, she's begging for, for, for one last hit. The whole time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh. yeah. She's a junkie. She started about six months ago while living with Selva. But she's been with Berto, or she knows Berto. Roberto Panero is his name, who's a partner of Selva's. A protege. Then... A protege. Yes. <laughs> yes. And yeah. then this he is a won't matter later in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't give it away. <laughs> and you know, I will say the Tubbs and Crockett, they have a really good good cop bad cop partnership, right? Because Tubbs is really pushing hard on her and Crockett is saying, uh, it's okay, you can trust me, I understand. And he says, I understand you I know you're just wants the boner. <laughs> no, I don't think that was a good cop, bad cop thing though. I just think he legitimately thought that Tubbs was being too hard on her because when he says like, Hey man, lay off or whatever, you see Marty look at him like, Why did you just mm. say that? He looked at him like paying attention I, I agree. Crockett was totally t- trying to boner. <laughs> No, cock- <laughs> I was going to call him something else. Cock it. Crock it. Cock it. Yeah. That's what he's trying to do. He's exactly. cocking it. Crock it. Crock it was doing police work, unlike Tubbs, who was like, she's just a spoiled brat who does drugs. So I don't want to listen to her crap, True. basically. True. Because, yeah, Tubbs mentions that as he's wa- as they're walking away, that he thinks that she's just a spoiled brat. So, I will have you remember, so though, back that, to the episode. that we do hear, so, I, will, I will say re- real fast, what, what we do hear for the first time we see here dealing with the monkey. And they say monkey and competition about a hundred times. And in they, this episode. And they never say the monkey on her yes. back. I am disappointed, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes. B- before we start talking monkeys, um, <laughs> they all walk away to like go get coffee or something. <laughs> Leave the witness alone, unprotected, the addict, for someone to just stumble in the room and maybe offer her drugs. To, uh, Which is exactly what know. happens. Berto shows up yeah. with some flowers, asks where she's been, and then says, hey, can I hook you up? Yeah, it's just amazing. The police work is just stellar. 
know. <laughs> well, I think so, they couldn't. Do, they couldn't do anything because she said she wouldn't work with them. That she wouldn't give them anything. And then remember, Crockett. She was, was like, also worried that she was going to get hurt if she said anything. Yeah, and that's exactly, and oh. that's what they said. Like Crockett said, like, well, you have to make the decision for yourself. We can't force you to do it. But we, you know, you need to kick, you need to kick the drugs basically. And when you're ready to like that. So, I mean, I think they, they didn't think they, they, she, they could force her to do it. <laughs> okay. So she didn't, she made the wrong decision and they said, you know what? We're not even going to protect you in the hospital. <laughs> well, no, cause there was no case yet. <laughs> <laughs> they found her during a sting in a brothel. <laughs> and they had Ivory Jones, so they didn't need her. That's, they hadn't even talked to Ivory yet about what he was going to have to do. They had him dead to rights, right? Because he's already mm. got, he's got, because remember, uh, you need to go back and, and say when they interrogated Ivory, they said, I bet you that he's got a bunch of women living in that house that don't have citizenship. We can use that against him. That, yeah, that's true. And they do use that in the scene after our next one. So our next scene is we go to the precinct and the entire vice team is going through all the files. And Gina has like the most information. So she's clearly done the most work out of everyone that's on the team. She's just spreading it around now. She says that the FBI has been following Silva for about a year and a half now. And recently, a called was Silva's partner, but he got killed, just mysteriously died. Who? But he was also engaged to Rosella. So you can see there's some tension internally with the gang that there's been a number of deaths in the last six months inside of Silva's gang. And there's been internal competition between Birdo and Silva. Competition. Uh huh. Here we go. All I heard during, all I heard during this entire conversation is that there's a brass monkey (laughs) and that it's kind of funky. It's a funky monkey. That and it's a competitive monkey. one. It's a competitive brass monkey. <laughs> <laughs> they must um, say monkey about 10 times during this scene. It switches from monkey to competition and then back to monkey. I don't know. It's it's quite the competitive monkey. <laughs> is what I have put together from this episode, that heroin is a competitive monkey. Birdo and Silva have been going hard against each other for the last six months, and they've been even killing each other's people over the last six months which is weird because they're in the same gang and you'll see how weird it is by the end of this episode how weird silva runs his gang it's a miracle actually he has a gang because it just seems like he on his calendar he's like i'm gonna kill five of my guys today and then i'm gonna sink a couple boats how does this man stay in business i asked remember i said why would you work for him you're he just kills people for fun like why am i gonna go back to work every day and yeah. wait for him to kill me. You know, yeah. And what's weird is that these guys are clearly trying very hard. I mean, not only are they meeting secretly on the beach to give the drugs, they even hid the drugs in fish. So, I yes. mean, they're, they're going all out to try and do a good job for him. So, the last two things on this scene is that we see that Tubbs and Crockett are in a severe disagreement on what to do with this. Tubbs does not believe that Rosella can give them more information. Crockett says, we at least have to try with her. That's the only thing that we have. Castillo's point is clear, though. He doesn't want to lose the line on Silva. No matter what's happening internally, they have to go figure out. They don't want to lose that they have an opportunity to go bring him down. Before we leave the precinct, we see Castillo, and he's checking out Ivory after all the interrogations that day. And that's, Melissa, that's when he finally convinces Ivory. He's like, we want you to come work for us. We want you to, sorry, we want you to go back to work for Silva and help the vice team figure out where he gets his drugs. And we're going to, how we're going to get you to do this is because we are sure that, sorry, we know that three girls inside of your brothel are here illegally. So in exchange for not bring, bringing you up on charges for them, you're going to come work for us. I do want to note, he does not promise to protect him. No, he never <laughs> said he would protect him. He said, you you just won't, It'll you'll look favorably with the feds basically or immigration it'll look favorably with them that you've done this and mm-hmm. they'll take yes, that into the consideration the vice squad has made it clear we do not protect witnesses that is <laughs> nope. not our job they don't <laughs> and at the end of this you see that <laughs> we have two real brief scenes one we have a driving scene where crockett is saying that he feels sorry for, for rosella you're starting to see that crockett thinks there's something up with her there's something that they can't they haven't been able to figure out yet on what her relationship is with Silva or whatever it is in it in, in her life. We have another we also have another quick scene at Silva's house. This is the first time we see Silva. And Rosella's there. She's just in like some lingerie, standing staring at herself in the mirror. And Silva comes in and says that she looks good and then just like jumps on top of her and she's telling him no. 
leave me alone. Birdo, I told Birdo everything about you. He's going to, he'd kill you for, for me. And Silva just says, basically like, go ahead and try and proceed to basically rape her, right? Yep. That's what happens. <laughs> That's the gist of that. Yeah. He just comes in and takes over and tells her like, no, just one kiss. And she's like, no, I don't want to do that. No. And then. That's it. Right, there you go. Fade to black. Yeah. So, so which, you know, at this point, we're not supposed to know she's his his daughter. Mm-hmm. But um, as you pointed out, um, she's lived in that, that in his house her whole life. We kind of read between the lines at this point. So this episode's already gotten creepy. I for sure like this scene. I was already like, she's his daughter. Yeah. He's way it's, older it's, than her. Yeah. She lived in that house. Like it's like yes, there's there's no surprise here. <laughs> That's no his shock. daughter. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> so the next scene is probably the best scene in the episode. And John, this is the episode. This is the scene that you're talking about with the smuggle and the drugs by fish. Um, yes. By fish. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> drugs by fish. So, I just. You know, you figure if you if you're doing the deal in the public place, maybe you hide him in the fish, or you bring the drugs to a secret beach meeting somewhere, and then you don't have to hide him in fish. True. No, you gotta um, cover your tracks, but, John. Well, how are they going to transport them? <laughs> they can't just transport reg- drugs regular in a van. They got to have a fish decoy. No one's going to go through all those fish to find drugs. Because most fish wholesalers pick their fish up on the beach. <laughs> yeah, they do. Apparently, well, no one knows where you picked it up from, though. I'm just, I'm just saying, like you're right. Like if someone came along on the beach and saw them, they'd be like, "This is really weird. Why are these people <laughs> yeah. boating their f- fish out to the beach? Why are they secretly <laughs> selling what their is fish? What's going on? <laughs> those cannot be fresh, right? Like those fish are not fresh. <laughs> That's that illegal kind of tuna, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the kind of tuna only rich people can get. It's warm. It's warm tuna. Because it wasn't even on ice, for the record. <laughs> no, it, you must have been able to smell them from miles so away. That's what, what ha- was happening. Yeah, so what happens when they put it in the truck and then, like, someone pulls them over to check the load and it's like, why is there no ice on this fish? <laughs> We're aging it. <laughs> what, what happened here is that Ivory told the duo this is where they do the drugs, the, the where, where they move the drugs. Thompson Crockett are watching. They say you can see that they move it from boat to boat to boat, and then they move it to land, and it goes it goes by van. So they're very thorough and try uh, on how they try and hide their tracks. We get a great line from Tubbs because he's still being kind of bitchy, and Crockett's like, "What's your deal?" And Tubbs says, "Quote: I'm tired, and when I'm tired, I get weird." <laughs> he didn't have to tell <laughs> us like, that though. <laughs> I kind of already knew that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when he's tired, he gets Jamaican. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's when jamaican tubs comes out <laughs> <laughs> silva's actually there he gets out of the van and has the boat as like the little dinghy comes pulling up full of the full of the fish with drugs in him roberto is delivering he's actually the one in the boat bringing the drugs t- to shore and then you see this like another competition thing happen between them Berto says hey i can do the next one in seven minutes silva hands him a briefcase and says there's $50,000 in it to do the last run. Berto tosses it into the boat. And then Silva says some things like, make sure this one doesn't drop in the water and definitely carry this one with you. Like a whole bunch of lines that were like, make sure you keep this close to you. Uh (laughs) And then he gets in the car and in total... 80s villain style pulls out the world's largest remote role. <laughs> we said that too. We said that too. Like, so, where does he hide that remote, first of all? Like, where was that hidden in the truck? Uh, it must have, have been been... in his fanny pack. I mean, you would need a separate carrying yes. device just for that remote control. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and why do you need a remote that big if it only has one button? I guess it's possible that you might want to be able to blow the bomb in space. <laughs> So you need some range on it is what I'm saying. Yeah, but the antenna wasn't big. It was just the actual remote. It was like a gigantic (laughs) brick or something. (laughs) (laughs) So Birdo heads out. He's going out to the other boat and Silva's watching in the mirror. And then as soon as Birdo gets to the other yacht, 
kind of boat that's out in the water. He hits the button and they explode. Tubbs and Crockett see the explosion. And I'm thinking the whole time, like, why did you wait and blow up all those other guys that are with Birdo? If that's what you had a problem with. Yeah. And the boat was like going out. The little boat was going out to the big boat for a long time. So he mm-hmm. could have like waited till it left the shore and then blown it up in between. But it was clearly like, no, I'm going to destroy both boats because I'm wasteful. <laughs> 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 I have a lot I of money want to, to wait. point out. I, I do want to point out that the duo should look, watch this and gone. You know what? Mental note: Don't vote out to the uh, to a meeting if yeah. this might happen in the future. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> Mental note, don't do anything with boats. Silva has a boat thing. Stay away from the boat. <laughs> so let's get to the auction where they agree to meet on boats. <laughs> where they agree to buy a boat. <laughs> yeah, so we go ahead over, we go over to the auction and do what's with Ivory. Ivory says that Silva's competition recently ran into, into some legal troubles so he's selling some of his assets to help pay for the legal fees Silva's gonna go and buy some of those yards just to lord it over the other person that he is still good but his competition has gone bad which I now that I think about it how are there so many giant drug dealers in Miami I, so big that they have gigantic yachts yeah exactly because um, they're all like from cuba no I'm and, then, <laughs> and they're all from you know, that's why it's so close to the all those that that country so that's when they true. get all the drugs true true yeah from colombia yeah, it's like a lot no, easier to get there okay so they're all in miami there's none in orlando or <laughs> anyone else's jurisdiction john as we learned in previous episodes orlando is nothing but safe houses <laughs> <laughs> hey that's where miami connection was actually at though in orlando just for the record oh that's true that's true so there's roaming ninjas that are keeping the streets safe up there. They don't got. They don't have this kind of problem. Yep, they don't have this problem because there's those damn ninjas <laughs> <are> selling the <laughs> drugs. <laughs> All right, back to the auction. Sunny needs her boat. <laughs> Silva finally shows up with with Rosella, and they're gonna bid on this giant yacht. And Crockett and Tubbs are sitting in the back with Ivory. Silva's up a little bit closer to the front with Rosella and the bidding starts. And basically Crockett starts forcing the price up on the yacht because he knows that Silva is just a sucker for a competition. He's not going to back down. He's just going to keep going. So Crockett basically just dips into his wallet for the tune of about $275,000. Competition. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you know, it's easy. You know, when you're on a vice cop salary, um, you, know, and you, you can afford yachts and, and you keep all the all the Ferraris that, that, that you stumble across. Oh, would you knock uh-huh. it off? He has it fair and square <laughs> legally. <laughs> I am not going to be surprised the next episode when he's around on this yacht. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suddenly I have a new yacht. <laughs> Elvis needed more place. Yeah, he needed a bigger place. To, a yard. He needed a yard. At the end, at the end of the bidding, Silva... He ends up winning the boat, but he looks back at Crockett. Grand Crockett's just got this like giant shitty eating grin on his face afterwards. And then he, he he's like just staring at Silva with this giant smile. And then he turns to Ivory and Tubbs and says, Are you sure he's not into guys? Like, he was I, looking at him yeah. longingly. He was. Like he was like like raising his eyebrows at Crockett. I mean Crockett did look good in that jacket, but like <laughs> seriously, he was like gazing at him longingly. Like, oh, you look really good. <laughs> so I was a little confused, missed a little bit of the of the scene, and I could have sworn I heard something come up about a boat race. That's where we're coming to next. So after the auction, the guys are sitting at the bar, and Silva sends over a bottle of champagne to them, and it comes over by a waiter. The waiter says, "This is from." <laughs> Sorry, Silva. the waiter. I'm laughing at the, the waiter now. <laughs> yes, the waiter is fantastic. He's got some skinny black <laughs> pants on with a sleeveless shirt, a pink giant puka necklace and a sailor's hat slightly off to one side <laughs> he looked like one of the village people that's what that one's yes. about <laughs> awesome silva sends it over the waiter says this is courtesy of silva because of the good competition today sunny says go in the ocean and then send a <laughs> new bottle Throw over to silva <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> send a new bottle back to Silva. A better bottle, is yes. what he said. Send something like yes. good or something like that. So then you see the waiter walk back over to Silva, and Silva's got a look on his face like, what the fuck are you doing here? And the, he's like, who brought this? And then the guy just stands up with this like huge shocked look on his face and points to Crockett across the bar. 
<laughs> and then Flash, all of a sudden, Crockett, Ivory, and Tubbs are sitting at the table with Silva. During this talk with Silva, they start, they go into this long talk, Crockett and Silva, Silva end up going into this long talk about basically whose dick is bigger. <laughs> and in that conversation, uh. John, is that, hey, I have a fast boat. And Silva says, that's an interesting toy you have. You know, I have a fast boat too. And Crockett says, me, you know, me and you should race. I can lay out a 10 mile map See, of us to race. I knew it. I knew it. I missed who brought it up, but I knew it. I knew Crockett was the one that brought up the boat race because that's always his angle with these drug dealers. Yes. Says, hey, how about we race? I have a fast boat, by the way. Maybe one yes. day he'll bring up his fast car. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Maybe he's not as good of a driver. That's why he always brings up the boat. There's less things to hit well, on. Well, for water. the record, he is, and those shots were like the boats driving and it's racing it's him doing it true he's not like I, I read that it's actually him. that's actually in the script do you think he just brings it up so they have to put him on a boat every episode yeah, it's like, <laughs> i really want to go on my boat today and we all know by the look on tubbs's face that he is not used to being on a boat <laughs> no he does not like being on the boat <laughs> <laughs> by the end of the discussion silver invites them over to his house for a party and that's where we go to next. The duo shows up at the party, and Silva's waiting for him at the front door with, with Rosella. He takes them over to see a painting of where he grew up. This is the painting of what I, where I grew up. That's my favorite cow. This is a picture <laughs> of a place I drove by once. Yeah, it's even got some chickens in it, I guess. A hut, basically. It's like a uh -huh. hut or something. You can see the shell, you can see the shell station in the background. <laughs> <laughs> but they never say who painted that painting no no and they talk you know, about how it's like it's like expensive right like oh it's worth a lot of money well who painted it did he paint it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah did george w bush paint it <laughs> in his bathtub no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tubbs asked him like how much is that worth like two hundred thousand dollars and silva says at least so in uh, the conversation <laughs> i don't think i think they need to have that appraised again because i don't believe that's worth two hundred thousand dollars also i do not believe that tubbs knows me? anything about paintings like what does tubbs know about painting <laughs> he watches bob ross <laughs> <laughs> he can recognize the happy the happy tree <laughs> Tubbs starts like really being a jerk to so Silva says he's got to leave and Tubbs starts being a real jerk to Rosella and she tells him to get lost so Tubbs just starts stumbling around the house opening closet doors and <laughs> taking paintings off, off and <laughs> pictures off walls and yeah stuff. He's, he's very fascinated with the pictures it's like mm -hmm. I cannot get over his like his, the acting in this scene because he's like, oh, there's a picture he must here. Be tired. Yeah, he's like, oh, this is a picture here. Wait a minute, there's another picture, another <laughs> picture. Like he just, it's like, can't you see them all around the room? Like right away, he's like shocked when he finds one, like stumbles across yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and, and they end up all being pictures of Rosella. So we're starting to get like, we get it. She's his daughter. Like we we get. And it. he takes creepy pictures of his daughter, like in the bathtub, in yeah. lingerie. In mm -hmm. wearing a hat with mm -hmm. lace on it. I don't know. Yeah. And then Crockett and Rosella start having a longer conversation. They step out onto a back patio. It's actually turned into evening now. So we actually have some time change that happens here. Tubbs happens so, to... Sucks throwing it on thick, too. Yeah. He's trying to yeah. get in there. <laughs> Would you stop? He is not. <laughs> well, he starts to push on her. Oh, like, yeah. Hey, I can feel like something. There's something you're not telling me. There's something really wrong here. And she just tells him you, she wouldn't like her anymore if she told him. Well, I mean, he didn't like her anyway. Let's get that straight. <laughs> not like he likes her now. <laughs> oh, no. He disagrees. He likes her a lot. In fact, he he, he can feel something between them. That's um, not what um, he that, thinks. You know. <laughs> and, and, and he wants to take her on, on the porch so that she can feel it too <laughs> well it, meanwhile Tubbs is still ninjaing around the house <laughs> not really he's not really good at ninjaing because so, what happens that uh, what happens next <laughs> alright fine I'll back down and say he's more like he's pink panthering around the house <laughs> yes da -do, da -do. Uh, <laughs> so if the photos weren't creepy enough he finds the porn room yeah, he finds AKA, the surveillance room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's got. He sees that there's cameras all over the house, and one of the screens has has Crockett and Rosella on it. And right as soon as he finds the room, Silva comes walking up from behind him, busted. <laughs> I saw you snooping around, <laughs> and in the creepiest way possible, it tells I like to watch. Yes. yes, she knows it drives me crazy. That's mm -hmm. what I like. It's like, what the hell? <laughs> exactly. It gets really creepy in that scene where he's talking about the cameras, but he does say. 
I want to do business with you guys. And so now Tubbs has set up a business deal with Silva. After all these conversations happen, it, the party it, changes from like a regular high-end party to dogfighting. I don't like that at yeah, all. Yeah, and so <laughs> it, it changes to dogfighting. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I really hope the vice team just shoots and kills everyone at the end of this episode. <laughs> Which is um, what Crockett says when they're out there, right? When they start bringing out the dog, he's like, I would really like to bring everybody in right now and just call this like the whole thing off. Like, just finish it up right now and just take everyone down. But he knows, like, they and can't. It, it wasn't until the dog fight scene that I realized that, man, there are a whole lot of white people in their, like, church best clothing, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, that's an odd thing. To see a bunch of people in like suits and in fancy dresses watching dog fighting because blood might you know get Go everywhere. <laughs> Based on my Jean Claude Van Damme knowledge, I would imagine <laughs> these types of things would happen in like a parking garage, or people would park in a circle with their headlights on and then watch from there. Yes, that is what happens in Jean Claude Van Damme stuff. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and then he does the splits right on top of their car. <laughs> 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 so Tubbs and Crockett talk to each other. We basically see that Tubbs is able to make the business deal with Silva. So he's going to continue to pursue that. On They're basically going to split up here. And then Crockett's going to continue to work Rosella because he feels like there's something wrong there, which he never – he's not the one to ever kind of – he hasn't ever to put yet. it together. <laughs> The duo decides to leave to say this place is the pits. They take off. We have a brief scene, the last scene in, in this. We see Silva and Rosella. They're having an argument. And the most important part here is base is Silva says, you're not, Rosella, you're not going to leave me. You need my money. And Rosella says, I can make plenty of money on my own. Ask Ivory Jones. Like a jerk. Like way yeah. to give up Ivory. He had nothing to do. It. he's done nothing wrong except pimp you out but he's done nothing wrong well no actually she, but she said like later on that he took her in and he was like nice to her and he told her like that she didn't have to do that so i mean i don't think that i guess i mean yes he was her pimp so i'm not, I'm not going to defend that but at the same time like i think he actually tried to like take her in out of kindness because she mm. had anywhere else to go cause, but she was a junkie but she basically set up ivory jones now because we know that silva is a jealous asshole that ivory jones is now gonna die we are not going to see yeah. him again in this episode. And his shark Had too, Ivory so. Jones held out with the feds, he might have been protected. But because Miami Vice has a strict no protecting witnesses policy. <laughs> okay, well, I disagree because I've seen enough Miami Vice to know that when you work with the feds, you get murdered. So, and I'll save that for later on because there's plenty of episodes where the feds have somebody and they get murdered because they lose them or they I'm don't know where they're at. <laughs> that it's just it's unfortunate that Vice has this strict no protecting witness policy. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, Ivory Jones seems to be pretty informed of the operation. He might have been useful come, come trial, but True. don't worry about that. No, no, it's See, John, there's two ways that you can go. You can protect the witnesses and make sure they make it to the trial and maybe you'll win. Or you just make sure you kill everyone before you get there. Problem solved. You just got to make sure See, you use I, both, either or. And I love the priorities of the vice team here because rather than spend the time and energy to protect Ivory Jones, they send the B team scuba, scuba diving so that they can <laughs> fix the boat so that Crockett can win the race. They're always playing the long game. This is one of the scenes, too, John, that you've talked about before. It's like they have a little bit of comedy before something serious happens. And so they have the B team planning the tracking device on Silva's boat. And they make a couple of jokes like, I don't know how fish do this. And that's why they're called fish. Ha, 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 B team. Uh-huh. <laughs> You leave the B team alone. <laughs> you don't deserve the B team. <laughs> we have one more quick scene before we get to the real meat of this episode. Uh, sorry, not the meat, but where where all the storyline starts to pay off. We have a brief scene at the pool at Silva's house. Rosella's floating around in the pool, and Silva comes up, steps on her hand, like ho holds her in place to talk to her. And if you read between the lines, because there's very few lines said in this, but gives away a lot information he grabs her and says have you been using it again i don't like it i don't like that you're hanging out with your young friends all the time and then she says yeah but you like to watch like well okay we just delivered a whole bunch of information here like she has people come over they're doing drugs together uh and then he's using the cameras to watch them 
do something. And then what does that mean? <laughs> do something. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, they well, know what they're doing. <laughs> they're playing Parcheesi. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm starting to question now what watching means. I don't think it means do the surveillance cameras. No, probably he means like he's in the room he watching. he has like, hole in the wall or... No, I think he comes in the room and he watches. That's what I yeah. think. Or he participates too. Like she mm-hmm. starts up with somebody and then. Oh, so you think like they're doing it and like he's sitting in a chair smoking mm-hmm. in the dark kind of like touching yeah. himself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like for sure. I don't think he's like just using the video cameras or mm-hmm. like, I mean, I think he uses the video cameras probably so he can record it or something and you look at it later. Something mm-hmm. even more this, sick. Uh, <laughs> this scene is kind of a very strange dynamic to it. Anyway, because it's like we get all that information, but it's just like a, a regular like tift between father and daughter for them. Like they're just kind of like, are you using it again? Oh, no, dad, I swear, you know, but it's like and all this information comes out. And it's like that is a screwed up house. Yeah. And a screwed up relationship they have. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's like there's not much said here, but there's a lot. It's the implications of what they say is what's staggering. Yes. Yeah. They insinuate a lot, but with the with yeah. less words. Mm-hmm. So um, if, if the vice team wasn't so oblivious to all of this, do you think they would have had an issue with her going back to, uh, well, we would consider an abusive household? Oh, yeah. I think if they knew, they would have not let her go back. And obviously, they wouldn't mm-hmm. have been as hard on her. As mm-hmm. they were, and that's that's what the whole thing is with Crockett. It's like he knew that there was something weird. He just didn't, you know, yeah. Couldn't pinpoint. It definitely makes it creepy with Crockett hitting on her all the he time. He was not <laughs> hitting on her. He was trying to help her. <laughs> the last thing that we have in this scene is that Silver shows her a necklace and then drops it into the water of the pool. We go over then a little bit later. We see Rosella walking up the steps inside of the abandoned brothel where she was working. With the ladies. So Gina and Trudy are there. And she called them to say that Ivory had taken good care of her. She needed help. And he was always there for her. And she pulls out the necklace that Silva had dropped in the pool. And she says, this was Ivory's necklace. He always wore it. Never took it off. So Ivory's dead. Yes. Yeah. And that scene was so frustrating. We get like a full minute of her just sitting on the steps babbling about stuff. And it's like, someone just shit her. (laughs) <laughs> so we can get through this like like we get it miles davis is dead you know well she also says that silva saw her with sunny and silva gets really jealous so they need to go warn tubs and crockett that silva's pro- probably going to go after sunny now so the ladies take off and you see upstairs that silva is upstairs in the brothel listening in on their conversation which i thought she was setting up the vice team that her and silva went and now there's now they're just trying to set them up. No, it turns out she's just really stupid because she yeah. could have used the phone, right? Like, call Crockett <laughs> on the phone and tell him, <laughs> help a man out. Tell him, <laughs> like, hey, he thinks we're doing it. He's going to kill you now. Well, well, Sonny was busy. Let's be honest. Sonny's busy out practicing for the race. <laughs> he's either Four practicing for the race or he's playing cards against he's trying to hustle old people playing cards. He's getting his little coffee down in the old part of town. He's got uh, stuff to do. He's a people person. Well, he is. He can't help it. He's so, <laughs> well, you know, well, he's so happy to talk to people. Is, at this point in the episode, uh, she basically, t- she just told Trudy and Gina that it's basically the meeting's going to be a setup. We go to the next scene and send up practicing racing. <laughs> <laughs> he's practicing swimming. He's scoobying out places. <laughs> <laughs> so we go through a bunch of other scenes and then at the very end, it's Sonny calling into them, and, and like still no one's telling them like, "Hey, this is a setup." So yeah, I, so I don't want to so, rush it. You see where I'm going with this? You're right, John. So we have this really fast stopover where Trudy's telling Castillo what's up at the precinct, and then Gina comes in and hands Castillo the stack of papers and says, "She understands why she's been lying, why Rosella has been lying to them, because the truth is really, really sick." And then we go over to the last scene of the episode. So I see exactly what you're saying is that because then at this scene. Tufts and Crockett are driving out in Crockett's boat, and they're going to go to this beacon to go pick up. That's where the drugs are supposed to be. And the B-team and Castillo are in contact with them on the radio, but you can tell they never told them, like, be prepared for a setup. Yeah, he said, yeah. we need to tell yeah. them, and we need to warn Tubbs and Crockett so, so they know. what. And it's like, when he found out the, the secret news, did it all, like, forget? Like, no, crap, we don't even need to tell Crockett that. <laughs> yeah. that. No one ever, still don't know. No one ever tell Tubbs and Crockett, so... 
all of a sudden, like, like they figure it out, and Tubbs is like, oh my god, this is a hit. And so he, he gets, like, Crockett back to the boat, and he gets on the radio, he's like, Castillo, it's a hit. Like, I'm sure Castillo's sitting in his office like, oh, shit, yeah, we were supposed to tell you. <laughs> yeah, no, Castillo's on the boat, and he calls them and says, like, we lost the boat. So Maybe. Silva's driving out, and he's, he's with Rosella, and then they switch boats, and then Castillo calls Tub, says, we lost them. You guys are on your own, no backup. Crockett calls out from the water and says, there's no drugs here, and Tubbs just yells out, it's a setup. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> so, I do want to point out, though, drug dealers were fancy in the 80s. They had yes. yachts. and They're on like a smaller and boat, about- and then they transfer over to a gigantic yacht. We get to the, the last moments of the scene. So uh, pulling up in the yacht is Silva. He's got his armed men on the roof. He's he's standing out on the railing with Rosella. Guns drawn. Tubbs and Crockett are trying to hide behind the boat, which both... A yacht cannot catch Crockett's speedboat. Why did they stay? Why didn't they just take off? That is still bugging Dude, me to this, this is, point. This is the strangest attempted murder in the history of <laughs> of vice operations. Yeah. Basically, they do three circles with the yacht, park, stop and have a conversation between Castillo, uh, I mean, between uh, Silva and his daughter. Mm-hmm. And then he hands the gun to his daughter. His daughter points the gun at Silva, says goodbye, and scene. He, 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 he says, he tells Rosella... I'm not going to kill Sonny, even though I normally kill those people because I care about you. See see how much I care about you? I'm not going to kill your boyfriend. And then he hands Rosella the gun and says, if you cared about me, you won't kill me. And I know you love me, so you won't you won't shoot and kill me. What were the three circles about? I don't know. Yeah, so they, they did like, they like showed the boat off a couple times. They like turned it around a few times. That way they can see the boat real good. <laughs> he had this guy shoot up in the air with a gun for a few mm-hmm. times. Just make a point. Yeah. So Silva says, Rosella, you're not going to kill me. We are flesh and blood. You're not going to kill me. She stops and thinks for a second. This is the strangest domestic call that they've ever been on. (laughs) That's what this is. She stops and thinks for a while. After like 20 seconds, she looks up and says, goodbye, daddy. And then you get a freeze frame on Crockett with his head down. And that's the end of the episode. Yeah. Just terrible. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i have Just, i have many thoughts about how this episode ended and we should probably save them for uh our final, final roundup <laughs> yeah. of this episode but just just if you can hear the frustration in all of our voices that all of a sudden that went from silva's guys were gonna kill tubs and crockett to an ending with a freeze frame on crockett and we don't know what happens at all we don't hear a gunshot fire we don't hear nothing this the the episode just ends with her saying goodbye daddy freeze frame episode's over and then next week they're gonna I'll get around on his boat and they're gonna be in family counseling <laughs> <laughs> well that's gonna do it for our rundown on this episode let's get over and talk about the music all right, John, there's got to be some good music in here. There's got to be something to make up for how this episode ends. It's a very British music segment, I will tell you that. We start with True Love by Wang Chung. Everybody Wang Chung tonight. <laughs> Damn it, um, I had that normally scheduled on Tuesdays. <laughs> Wang Chung being a British uh, new wave group. They had five top 40 hits between 1983 and 1987. The band was um, made up mostly, well, the foundation of the band uh, was Jeremy Ryder, a.k.a. Jack Hughes, because having a an alias isn't weird at all. <laughs> and he was the vocalist and first. And then the other, fa- uh, the other founding member was Nick Feldman, the bassist. They're famous for that song, Everybody Fun Tonight. So the band started out in 1980, and they broke up, broke up, reformed a bunch of days with a bunch of different names, and finally settled on Huang Chung, H-U-A-N-O. And that was when they started actually putting out albums. And in 1983, Geffen would sign them making them the uh, second British artist to sign with Geffen. And that's when they would change it to Wang Chung uh, rather than Huang Chung because people kept confusing it and kept calling it Chung. They broke up in uh, 
in the 90s, a few uh, reunion tours in the 2000s. In 2005, they appeared on a reality show called Hit Me Baby One More Time. Mm. And performed Everybody Have Fun Tonight and covered Nelly's Hot in Here. <laughs> well, wait, I need to hear the Wang Chung cover of that song. I, I need to. My body I, needs to yes. hear that cover. <laughs> I, I agree. And I, I felt the same way. And so I spent about 20 minutes looking for it on uh, YouTube. It is spectacular. <laughs> I am definitely, definitely putting a link to that video in the show notes. So the second song of the episode is Slave to Love by Brian Ferry. Brian Ferry is an English singer-songwriter. The song Slave to Love is off of album Boys and Girls in from 1985. Whoever wrote the Wikipedia for Brian Ferry um, is a big, big fan because <laughs> they, 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 they like tell everything this guy has done. And, and according to them, he's like David Bowie. In fact, he inspired David Bowie. Damn right. <laughs> so even though I had never heard of Brian Ferry before this show, this is the second song he is crazy. Um, and the second time I've had to read his, uh, Wikipedia, which only Martin. Izzy could have written better. Yeah. <laughs> so, Barry, Brian Ferry became popular as the vocalist and founding member of the glam rock, art rock band, C Music, who, uh, spanned from 1970 to 1982. They had three number one albums in time. I am going to asterisk on that. They had three number one albums in the UK. Mm, so, okay. So, not America. So, very, so you know, very the, the minor arts. leagues. Minor <laughs> leagues. In 83, he, he left the band and pursued a, his solo career more. So, the, the author of the Wikipedia article would like to uh, me to say that the time when he was in the band also counts as part of solo time because he's such a masterful artist. <laughs> a little background, he studied art at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, <laughs> Wait, did he like travel back in time to the Middle Ages to study art? Dude, England's weird, okay? <laughs> so the it's the University of Newcastle upon, U-P-O-N, Tyne. <laughs> So it's the new castle that's up on time, not, not the one over on O'Reilly Street. The one up on time. <laughs> After he graduated, he was a pottery teacher at Holland Park School. He played in multiple bands and finally said, screw it. In 1968, he moved to London to pursue music. And he's still got, I mean, I will give him that. He is still touring and putting out music even to this day they even did a reunion tour of the band roxy's music so and he has this song was featured in movies fire with fire bitter moon malice and probably the most recognizable movie out of the bunch and a half weeks with mickey rourke and kim basinger mm. That sounds so, like a Melissa and, movie. Uh, oh, I, I love yeah. that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so th this song was in it. It was also on the TV show Vice and on uh, an episode of Scrubs. So mm. I guess I was exposed to him before Miami Vice. So our third song is, and our final song, is Robert Plant's Little by Little. He's back. So, uh, yes, again, Robert Plant. And this is the second time, maybe the third time he's on this list. I don't know. I'm running out of stuff to talk about. <laughs> um, so, obviously, he's the uh, lead singer of Led Zeppelin. Also English. So, connecting the three. This was his third album, Shaken and Stirred, 1985. Third solo album. Little by Little was a song on the album and was number one on the mainstream rock charts for two, for two weeks. Even though this is the only solo album released in the 80s that didn't go platinum for Robert Plant. Plant. This one only went gold. That's surprising that any album he would release wouldn't go platinum. Yeah, I know. I know. It, it, it could be a um, whole album of him just tuning a piano, and I would still buy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this song was written by Plant and keyboardist Jez Woodruff. Video feed Plant at a cottage in Wales where Zeppelin gathered at one time to write their third album. And there's also rumors that that is the same cottage in the music video that they came up with the original version of Stairway to Heaven, which I watched the video. It is like a small village. It's so like exactly what you would think a small 
Pillaging whales would be thatch roof with moss on it, in, sheep running yeah. around all over the place. Yeah, there's this whole part where, the, for some reason, pe- people are walking with several horses wearing <laughs> um, wood clothes like they're from the 30s, only it's modern. <laughs> there's some weird cutaway of a white room with chick in a wedding dress, you know. But then it's always back to this town, this this cottage in Wales. And the 30 or so people that live there who look like you would imagine 30 people <laughs> who live in a small town in Wales or Scotland would look. Um, not not very impressive. It, 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 that's pretty much it because I pretty much covered Robert Plant before. Yeah, and I have to say, I'm, I'm desperate to finish talking about this episode so I could go find that Wang Chunk cover song. So, <laughs> you know, anyone who does a Nelly cover song, I am in. Oh, I know. I know. Especially a 80s new way. <laughs> <band. laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Uh, let's go talk about our final thoughts to this episode. because I think we have plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'll kick off this week because uh, I have I'm gonna try and narrow this rant down, and it has everything to do with how this episode ends. And I think we're all in agreement that that's where the problem is with this episode. It was telepathic from the very beginning that Rosella was Selva's daughter. There was no secret there at all. There was no no hook or twist at the end that make it so that we were surprised, even though they tried to deliver it that way. When Gina comes in and hands castillo that paperwork and then they do the reveal on the boat that you know we are flesh and blood you wouldn't kill me it was no surprise it's for sure if there's something sick going on that's his daughter when this episode it does a good job of building up to the end too so you just know that there's something sick like you know what's going to happen you just can't wait for it to get there so they do a good job of building up to it we point out there's some big plot holes going on through the episode but all in all it does a pretty good job of building up to it it is kind of a Kind of a big reveal when you find out that Ivory's dead when she does it at the brothel and she shows that it was his necklace. In all, it does okay. And then up to the end, it just falls flat on its face. And we were talking about before we started recording in the pre-show, we were talking about, I was saying that my thoughts were that this episode needed to be about 15 minutes longer. But my advice can only be 50 minutes in total. So they just had to hurry up and rush the ending. So then they do this thing where she pulls a she he hands her the gun and then that's how the then it just freeze frames on the end but there's no answers at the end of this episode you don't hear a gunshot you don't know how the vice team escapes they're surrounded by heavily armed men on a gigantic boat also why don't the duo just get in their speedboat and drive away as fast as possible why do they hang out there's so many questions at the end of this episode that go unanswered and we know that none of this is ever going to come back we are never going to know what happened the only hope that we have is that there's some mention of it next week because it's the same director that does the very next episode there's so i have so many frustrations with how this episode ends we get no answers it's very weird and awkward that whole thing where they like spin the boat around a few times before they fire the beat before they put on like this show for tubs and crockett to watch to see what's to see how rosella and silver are gonna end their uh their their problems that they're having with each other and then just for the sheer fact of how many times crockett says monkey in this episode it's an additional layer of frustration and all i say it was good up until the end and now at the end just ruined it for me i know it's, i've been really hard on this yeah, episode but um, i was so let go i was so let down I, and i'm gonna be just as hard on it i didn't feel like i was watching an episode of miami vice like i was watching an episode of dallas or mm-hmm. as the world turns And, like, Miami Vice was guest starring, you know? It was, like, one of them crossover episodes. (laughs) And we were stuck on, like, the Dallas side. You know how they do them crossover episodes? And, like, one week you watch Dallas, and you see... And then the next week you have to watch the other show to see the second half of it. Mm -hmm. I felt like I watched, like, the soap opera version side of it. And at the end of the episode, I felt like, okay, so now it's going to pick back up on the Miami Vice side, only it's not. So I just, I felt like throughout the entire episode, the Miami Vice characters were just side characters. Nothing they do, they, they really didn't, they helped drive the episode to where it was going, but they had very little relevance as far as what was going on. You know, and I think part of that was due to the lack or sloppiness of the police, of the, of the little bits of police work that they were supposed to be doing during 
in the episode, you know, they were pretty much just along for the ride. I seriously expect next week we get a we, we get a tune in and we get to see where like the Miami Vice version picks up it just felt like a different show yeah i agree i agree most so what are your final thoughts i disagree no i'm joking <laughs> <laughs> i disagree completely no no i mean i completely agree with you guys that it was definitely not a usual miami vice episode in the fact that the miami vice cast did not they were not the stars of this episode they were definitely along for the ride they were there i think that this episode suffered from they were trying to make it like a hard hitting dramatic episode like we're gonna hit you in the gut with this like can you believe it it's so sick that that's his daughter Mm -hmm. you know like this is this is uh incest this is a a, probably molestation you know like we're gonna hit you with this deep and so that was what they were trying to just portray their relationship was what took the spotlight in the show i think it fell because it's a police show and you're supposed to be doing like solving a crime and in actuality they didn't solve any crimes like really no. we don't know oh we don't know they if they really solved did. any crimes because we, they they we don't see what happens at the end we don't know was there drugs on that boat did they ever find his drugs did they ever actually they never actually found where the drugs were coming from so the end is what really messes it up if like if they had you're right i think you're right if they had had like 15 to 20 more minutes and they had tied it all up, you know, a package. Okay, so let us know. Did she shoot him? And then after she shot him, what happened? You know, mm-hmm. did she get arrested? Did they go back to his place and figure out, like, where does she know who, where the drugs come from? I just mm-hmm. don't. They just didn't wrap it up. But I don't think it's, like, as bad as you guys are p- portraying it to be. But <laughs> uh, Okay, yeah, I mean, we're being a little harsh. I'm sure, like, you know, Spicer would say that it was the greatest episode ever. ever. <laughs> well, yeah, Everyone of course. It. But... <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I definitely think it's just, you're right. I think John's right. It's not the usual Miami Vice episode where, mm-hmm. but I think what is going to happen is that because I've seen all the episodes is that you guys, there's going to be a lot of episodes where you're like, wait a minute, this is not a regular Miami Vice episode. The epi- the way they are is going to change is what, that's all I'll say. Like a lot of stuff changes. Okay, so that Vice formula is going to change basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just doesn't, it's just not the same in every single <clears throat> episode like it was in season one, right? Where they had like a formula. Mm-hmm. There's some bad cops. We're going to murder everybody. <laughs> Crockett <laughs> might try to sleep with someone. Tubbs does actually <laughs> sleep with someone. Like that's not the same, you know. <laughs> We're going to see Tubbs sweaty. <laughs> Crockett's going to wear a shirt undone but i mean like no i mean like i said i don't think it's a bad episode i like it but you're right i definitely would have liked it better if they would have closed it out in the end and again melissa you because of your 80s prowess and understanding <laughs> mostly you always bring up a point that uh, we kind of skip because even though we don't like how the ending is it's still it's still good for my advice it, because they covered a topic that no one would talk about especially on network tv we have incest yeah. we have rape i do have to give them credit for that They just didn't have an ending for this episode, but I will give them credit for it was an episode where they weren't afraid to tackle a sensitive topic, especially for network TV. And they nobody talked about, I mean, because I watched the show when it was new. So like you would see these episodes and it would be the talk next day would be shock, right? That they had ever put that episode out there. There are several Mm -hmm. episodes where you'll see it and and then it would be like in the 80s. It would have been like, oh my God, can you believe that Mm -hmm. they put this episode? Like I was not supposed to watch that show because it was too... I was young, but it was too risque and it was yeah. too crazy. They had these crazy storylines yeah, with drugs they, and, and they, sex. They never do that on chips. <laughs> well, no, because they never, they never. There's nothing on chips. It's like so wholesome. It's like they give each other high fives and thumbs up. <laughs> I mean, I think maybe that John and Ponch were gay, maybe, and it was like a secret storyline no one knew about. But other than that, <laughs> well, no incest. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I know we were a little hard on this episode, but we have had a string of fantastic Vice episodes. So one was going to come up where we were going to be a little hard on it and maybe it wasn't our favorite episode. So that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. Be sure to check us out on our website, GoWithTheHeat.com. Click on About Us. You can find the ways you could follow your hosts here on this show or click on Subscribe and find all the ways that you can listen to the show youtube stitcher itunes google play regular rss you can pretty much find us anywhere we really appreciate you listening to the show and we would love to hear from you emails go with the heat at gmail.com that's going to do it for us this week and we'll catch you all next time do yourself a favor go listen to some miles davis